Good afternoon to everyone in this part of the world. Good morning and good evening to those tuning in from abroad. I would like to welcome you all to the 18th edition of our Mentoring Talks series and the sixth edition of the Virtual Mentoring Lectureship via WebEx. When I initiated the Mentoring Talks series on October 19, 2016, my intention was to help students find their purpose. I did not envision that we will eventually all need these mentoring talks. During these trying times in Lebanon, with the COVID-19 pandemic hitting us pretty hard, among the many other problems that Lebanon has been facing since October 2019, unprecedented populist uprising, economic collapse, devaluation of the national currency, political unrest, in addition to the horrific recent chemical explosion that destroyed a large part of our beloved Beirut. These mentoring talks are now a necessity. Depression, frustration, sense of losing hope, and the inability to cope with the stress are spreading among all of us. We shall rise up, we will rise up. Our today's guest is uniquely qualified to show us how to transform our tiring turmoil into a true positive change. It is my utmost privilege to welcome Mrs. Fadumu Daib for our today's mentoring talk. Fadumu is a public health specialist and politician most famously known as the first female presidential candidate to run in her native Somalia. Fadumu began from humble beginnings as a refugee born to two hardworking yet illiterate parents. In fact, she herself did not learn to write and read until the age of 14, according to the International Business Times. Civil strife caused her to move around from Nairobi to Mogadishu, finally taking her to Finland and to Abidjan. Yet, instead of allowing these circumstances to take her out of the race of life, Fadumo stands as a brilliant example of resilience in the face of adversity. This is well testified by her illustrious career as a social activist respected nurse turned public health expert and UN peace advocate. Her story has always been a true inspiration to women and indigenous peoples around the globe. After spending many years in Europe, Fadumo decided in 2016 to return back to Somalia with the promise of a presidential campaign. Though this decision incurred hatred and death threats upon her, Fadumu's fearless perseverance shined above and beyond her detractors. Leaving behind her four children in Helsinki, she returned to a Somalia that was and is suffering from the aftermath of war, impoverishment, and governmental corruption. Despite knowing that her chances of winning head of state were very little, she never backed down. Her drive was so adamant that she told the Associate Press that she is willing to wait for 20 more years, if necessary, to reach her ultimate goal. That goal, of course, is the betterment of the lives of her fellow citizens. Growing up, Fadumo witnessed firsthand the horrors and desolation of the inadequate healthcare in the Global South. Perhaps, this motivated her career into nursing and public health, which has saved countless lives in Africa and abroad. Fadumo subsequently studied at Harvard in the hopes of acquiring more skills that may assist her with her political endeavors of bettering her country. Many valuable lessons can be gleaned from the awe-inspiring biography of Fadumo Daib. But perhaps the most important is realizing that you don't have to achieve success 
in spite of your life circumstances. Rather, it should be directly because of them. With that said, please give our guest a warm round of applause as she begins the 18th talk in our series entitled Non-Conformists Make the World a Better Place. Fadumo, the floor is yours. You need to unmute. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. And uh, it's, it's actually a pleasure to address the students and um, other people who are also part of this mentoring talk. I must start by by saying that um, Beirut is a fantastic city. It's an amazing city. I actually visited it a few years ago. And um, there is a parallel between what is going on in Beirut currently, what is happening or has happened in Somalia. The parallel is that both of these countries have actually been to a civil war. And, uh, when I visited um, a few years ago, I saw a Beirut that was flourishing. Yeah. Although I also saw some buildings that were remnants of the civil war, but there was optimism, there was hope. And I was actually very touched and uh, motivated to hear that the reconstruction was largely because of the Lebanese diaspora that was heavily sort of like investing in the, in the country. And as I watched that, it dawned on me the important role that the Somali diaspora is also playing inside Somalia. Somali diaspora is actually remitting 1.5 to 2 billion US dollars a year back to Somalia. This is the money that actually runs the informal economy inside the country. And so I chose to start from this point so that you can perhaps understand why I felt that it was important that I should go back to Somalia attempt to right the leadership wrongs in that country. Going back from the Finnish diaspora where I had lived for more than 25 years and from which I actually left um, Somalia is really tied to what a lot of the Lebanese diaspora must be feeling outside of the country for those who have returned. So having started from that point, uh, I'd like to add on to what Bilal had already said as part of the introduction. What really motivated a healthcare specialist to go into politics, to leave the comforts of working uh, in the UN as a, as a UN careerist, to go back to Somalia and really make that change? It's because I felt that having gone into nursing because it was a vocational calling, I believe that I'm here to serve humanity. And that belief came from the fact that my mother lost 11 children to treatable viruses and diseases. I was a first child to actually survive. Years later, when my mother came to Finland, learned how to read and write at the age of 60 something years old in Finland and then becoming sick and succumbing to cancer in, in Finland and watching the Finnish healthcare personnel taking care of my mother, that belief being a servant of serving humanity became very entrenched. 2004, when I went back to Somalia, 2005, I left after having watched uh, the evening news in Finland. I was breastfeeding my baby, watching the news. There was a Somali mother ha that had walked almost three kilometers with, a, with her baby on her back, trying to get to the nearest health center. 
by the time she arrived at the health center and had taken the baby down, the baby was already dead. As, as I sat in Finland watching this, uh, the woman that I saw on the screen was my mother. And that baby that had died was one of the 11 children that my mother had lost. And right there and then I felt that I must do something about what had happened to that mother. That there must be a reason why I studied nursing, why I was spared, why I was given the opportunity to be in Finland, to have all those opportunities extended to me. It meant that I had to give back to people who didn't have similar opportunities. So when I went back to work in Somalia with the UN as a, as a public health specialist, I was serving women like my mother and their children. While there, I came to realize that the problems in Somalia were more systemic, they were more challenging, and they required something more innovative and sustained to be able to actually change the fabric of the society. And I felt that I didn't have those skills. I might save one or two mothers, but I needed to do more than that. So when I left uh, Somalia to go uh, work in the Pacific Island countries, and from there I went back to Liberia, I still felt that I was lacking. But Somalia never left my mind after that. So I decided in Liberia that I wanted to actually do something about what had been in my mind had been nagging me all along, and that could not give me peace of mind. So I entered Harvard to become a rounded person, to become of use to Somalia so that I could make that country a better country, give uh, Somalis an opportunity to decide whether they wanted someone like me or any other person to lead them. And I wanted that to happen through democratic uh, elections. So in 2014, September, when I announced I wanted to run for political office, it was with the understanding we were going to have one person, one vote, democratic elections. In 2016, when the then administration reverted back what is called the 4.5 clan based government system. Uh, it's a system that actually subjugates women. It's a system that believes that half of uh, the Somali populations are subhumans because they come from clans that are perceived to be uh, less of a human being or they're, they're seen to be uh, unclean because the four major clans are seen to be clean and you know real Somalis. So I had a I had a dilemma, a moral dilemma, trying to run in a system that actually refuses to acknowledge my existence because the clan-based system doesn't count women. It's a system that is highly uh, subjugative, it's oppressive, and it's actually inhumane. It's the only system that exists in this world. And so I had to choose between running in a system like that or waiting for the day that democratic elections uh, come. It has taken us now four years, still entertaining that system. That system was supposed to be temporary. We have been using it for 21 years. So it looks to me like if that system hasn't been removed in the past four years, then we need um, we need to take action to really remove that system so that Somalis, over 12 million Somalis, will finally have the chance to choose who they want to lead them. And before opening the floor for questions, I want to say that I'm not a politician. For a long time, 
I felt being called a politician or the, the tag, the name politician really carried a lot of negative connotations to it. When you hear of a politician, the first thing that comes to, to mind is a slimy, you know, uh, unreliable, <laughs> dishonest character that is hell-bent on amassing wealth, embezzling uh, public funds. I think you, you get to the picture when we talk about a politician. By stepping forward, I wanted to change that perception to say, we don't need to have those politicians power. We put them there, be it through the clan-based system or through other means. So, if, and we know what we want from them. We see that they're not capable of providing what we want for them. So why don't we step forward as lay persons and take on that responsibility. And I took that step forward because I believe reconstructing, rebuilding Somalia is a moral obligation. It's an ethical obligation for anyone who is a citizen of a country. If they see things are not going as they should, then we need to step forward and really say, we are the leaders that we have been waiting for. My mother waited. Ever since she came to Finland, she had this hope that she would be able to go back. She spent all her time talking about how beautiful Somalia was. And it really pained me to hear the way my mother spoke about Somalia, the love that she had for the country, and the realization in her last few months that she will never be able to go back to the country. She will die in a foreign country where she's a second class citizen, where she's seen as a beggar, that this was where she was going to be laid to rest. It's that image really pushed me forward. I am not an extrovert. I never like to be in the public. Anyone who knows me will tell you that they are even surprised to see what I'm doing. But I felt compelled that no other Somali mother or father should die in foreign lands, pining away for the country that belongs to them because we refuse to come forward and refused to give them back that dignity that was taken away from them, refugees. So I want to end this by saying that as you are students in your university and you're looking the situation in Lebanon, you are hurting for your country. You know you're not happy with what is happening. You know you're not happy with the leadership that is there. Ask yourself, what is it that you can do for that country? Make sure that you step forward. Despite all the challenges that you might be faced with, step forward because that is your responsibility as a Lebanese. Don't wait for someone else to do that. Take the first step. That's, that's, that's what matters, is the fact that when something was, was wrong, you decided would not sit back and just watch helplessly, because you're not helpless. You're actually very powerful. That you stepped forward, did what was ethically and morally correct. So I am not big fan of victimhood, the victim narrative of saying, oh, this, this has happened because other people are doing this to me, other people are, are doing that to me. You know, a lot of things have happened to all of us, but I believe that we are given the opportunity to take back that power and to, to correct that narrative. And so all of us have that. Like us, to be the critical mass that moves forward and that change changes the, the societies that we live in, the countries that we live in. By doing so, we leave at least a positive footprint on this earth. So tomorrow when you leave, all of us are going to die. We're going to leave this place. At least live 
a positive footprint so that people would say, oh yeah, there was somebody like that who existed. They did this or they did that. I think that's something that should compel and motivate all of us. So I'm open to taking any questions. I'd like us to have an interactive discussion rather than me giving a lecture or anything like that. I'm, I'm here to take your questions. I'm here to, to discuss uh, anything and everything that you would like to discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much. On behalf of all attendees, I would like to thank you for uh... Uh, your uh, um, beautiful uh, uh, remarks and uh, I open the floor right now for questions. Uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A box. Indicate uh, what you do, where you come from. I will be reading the question and uh, uh, Mrs. Daev will be answering the questions. So I'll start with the first question. This is from uh, Tufi Imran. He's a chemistry undergraduate student at AUB. What was it like to have your life threatened? Did it refrain you from running for president and or continuing path? Um, having my life threatened was actually, um, I saw that as a form of vehement, uh, as a compliment. Because you only get death threats when people actually think that stand a chance or your mere existence is going to change something so otherwise no one would have uh, paid that much attention to you so when i received that threat i actually felt that it's honored and that i was on the raw you know on the right track that what i was doing wasn't wrong it was actually morally correct as a result, this is the confirmation that I am getting that I should continue doing what I am doing because I am on the right track. I didn't really um, think of it um, something that was going to stop me from doing what I wanted to do, and it will never stop me from wanting to do what I want to do. No person, no living person is going to do that. No one has that power. It's with that belief that I take very concrete steps. Everything that I do from the time I was a child up until where I am, I have never stepped forward without having a very strong conviction that what I was doing was right. So nothing stops me. Nothing will ever stop me from doing what is right. Thank you. Uh, second question from Lina Taif, another student from AUB. You are such a courageous and brave woman. Who, what inspires you the most? A lot of us, I would say most of us are very courageous. I believe every human being is born with that courage. The, that courage is forced to come out certain moments in your life either by certain events or or um, or people around you so every one of us is born with that courage uh, within us i've been asked many times who are my role models who who has really inspired me who has <laughs> and to me I always say it is my mother because I would not be where I am today if it weren't for my mother. My mother was a very strong driving factor in life. And, um, I, I would say that I have 1% of the courage that my mother has had. My mother was a very, very courageous woman. She was a non-conformist. My mother was a businesswoman. Uh, she is what uh, we currently call a motivational also a speaker, because she always used to say it to me that 
the world owes owe us, it doesn't owe us anything, that we shouldn't have any entitlements or any expectations from any other people other than ourselves. So that was one thing uh, used to tell me. The other thing that my mother used to tell me was that the world is in my palm, it's in my hand. What I do with it is up to me. She used to say to me that you are either uh, the one who is going to build yourself up or you will be the one that uh, breaks uh, you know or destroys yourself no other external uh, factor or entity will ever be able to do that my mother was a she was a dreamer but she was also capable of putting things into concrete actions so she would ask me as a poor we were a poor family you know in kenya You'd ask me, Fadumo, when you grow up, what do you want to be? And a lot of my peers uh, were dreaming of working in the UN as secretaries. It was the only thing that, as, as children at that time, we thought was really the highest that you could ever get to was to become a secretary in the UN compound in Kenya. She would say, let's take a taxi, even though we were not able to really uh, afford doing that. She'd say, let's go, let's take a taxi. Say, Fadumo, here we are in front of the UN uh, compound in Nairobi. You are working in the UN. I'd say, oh no, but I don't even know how to read and write. She'd say, no, look at that gate. One day you will enter that compound. So now you are working in the UN. Where do you want to live? And I'd say, oh, I want to go to Spring Valley. It was a place where a lot of the whites lived, a lot of the rich people lived in Spring Valley. Uh, I'd say, I want to live there. She said, let's drive to Spring Valley. Fadumo, you work in the UN. You live in Spring Valley. Where do you want to shop? So I want to go to Uchumi, which was really at that time, one of those big uh, supermarket outlets in Kenya. And we would go there. She said, Fadumo, you work in the UN. You live in Spring Valley. You shop at a Chumi. Where do you want to have coffee? I say, oh, I want to go to Sarit Center. There was a big mall where rich people would go. We would go there and she, she would repeat the same things. Fadumo, you work in the UN. You live in Spring Valley. You shop at Uchumi and you are drinking coffee at, uh, at Sarit Center. Where do you want to be? This is what she did. Weekend, whenever it was feasible and possible, she would drive me through my dreams. She say, look at that, look at this. You live there, you shop here, you do this. Look, remember, keep this in your mind, keep this in your mind. And I learned that from my mother. Sometimes when I go through those roads and I drive, because when I was living in Nairobi, I would take my children, we'd get in the car and we would drive I'd show them, listen, this is where I came with my mother. This is where we went. This is where. And it would really break my heart that she wasn't there to see that. Because from everything she said that I would do, I went and I did that. I learned that for you to accomplish something, you must be able to dream. You must be able to visualize that must then put it into concrete action, which means you just can't sit there and dream that it is going to happen. You have to work hard for it. When it comes to you, take the blessings that come with it, because you are blessed to have that. Not many people have that. Then you move to the next concrete steps, other dreams that you have to realize. So she was my role model because she showed me through action that it was possible. When she came to Finland, she was illiterate. She said, Listen, I will show you. I will learn how to read and write. And she did. At, you know, she was over 60 years old. She was competing and even coming on top of the class. She was sitting in a class with younger refugees and my mother would come on top of the class when she was doing her assignments. And that way she was showing me it is possible it can be done. So I would be disloyal if I didn't say 
my mother was my biggest motivator but she's also the role model that I aspire to and I I really think she prepared me very well for this for this world and I try to reciprocate that by the way I bring up my own children so she was my role model and she will always be my role model Uh, we have a couple of questions from Somali students here in, uh, at AUB. So I'll start with the first one from Uba Ali. Uh, she is a Somali undergraduate student at AUB studying political science and international law. The question, what advice would you give the local Somali, Somali women who are demanding more inclusive system? What, would, what advice would I give to the local uh, Somali women? who are demanding uh, for, for inclusive their, system, more inclusive them. system. Yeah. So who are demanding for their participation or uh, inclusiveness or to be part of the society. And you know, to me, this is why I, I think of myself as a non-conformist because I don't believe I need to ask a question, you know, like that. Oh, I don't believe that I, I need to be included in, 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 in positions or discussions that are taking place because I believe I have those rights. I will just appear at the table and sit there. And I think uh, for us Somali women, I think it is high time that we really moved away from begging or even asking or even requesting to be allowed to be part of these processes. I think we should just knock down the door. We should break it down and we should come in there by force because no one is going to give us that opportunity and look at the history of somalia when somalia was getting liberation it was because of women women were at the forefront of the somali liberation they sold their gold they sold all their assets to make sure that somalia became independent country and when that happened the men that they were fighting beside and whom they were funding Somali women funded the independence of Somalia. And when those men came into power, what they did was they completely sidelined them. They completely made sure they never came into that space. And I think that's a lesson that we need to learn that our brothers, our sisters, our fathers, our, our brothers, our sons, you know, our fathers, they're not going to give that space to us freely and so it is for us to take it from them and somali women lead somalia informally we lead that country informally the same way african women actually lead the continent if it weren't for us this continent somalia would not even exist and so we have already been bestowed by this with this power we are way bigger than where we are currently. And we should not be asking for these things. We shouldn't be running after the 30% gender quota. Please give me the gender quota. Please make me into a minister. No, we are going to formalize the leadership that we are already undertaking inside the country. We want to make that formal. And that is why I stood up to run for the presidency in Somalia. This was to signal that we have moved beyond formal leadership to formal leadership. We are going to formalize that. We are going to sit at the table as leaders and we are going to chat the way forward for Somalia because we know what is best for Somalia. We have done it informally behind the scenes. This time around, we're going to do it formally at the head of that table with everyone 
fully aware of it. And we will do it without having to negotiate for our existence or our rightful place at the table where decisions are made. So I think Somali women should just break doors, they should break uh, the windows, and they should just jump into that room, and sit wherever they want to sit, because it is their right. They shouldn't ask for it. They already have it. They should just take it. Thank you. Very inspiring. Um, this question is uh, coming uh, from another Somalian uh, student, graduate student from uh, the Faculty of Health and Sciences at the AUB. His name is Abdiwali Siyad. Uh, his question, are you willing to run for president again? We are grateful for the way you provide hope to millions of Somali youth. Thank you um, very much. Yes. I will always run for office until I get in. So the moment when I stepped forward and I said I wanted to leave Somalia, I meant it. I really meant it. As a result of doing that, I lost a lot of opportunities. I lost dear relationships. I lost people who were very dear to me. I had to give up certain things to be able to continue walking down that air. So yes, the same way that our forefathers and mothers had inspired me you look at the liberation fighters in Somalia, it would be really a disservice not to continue their legacy. You know, the legacy before all these things started happening, the civil war, before uh, the coup, when the country was taken by force. You know, I remember what Somalia was like in the 80s. I remember walking on those streets. I remember going to the cafeterias. I remember going out with my family for ice cream. I, I remember the glory, the beauty of Somalia. How proud we were as Somalis. We are a nation that was born with pride. We are a nation that will gain its pride and its dignity. We are a nation that is blessed. Somalia is a country that is abundant. It is going through trials, but it will come out of it. It will come out because you and I and many others like ourselves are going to make sure that it does. So, yes, I will do that many, many times till I get in. Thank you. Uh, this question is uh, coming from uh, Yumna Saadi, undergraduate student at AUB. If you knew, as you said in the Guardian newspaper, that the likelihood of you winning is non existent, what is the thing that gave you a little hope to believe that it may actually happen? So in 2014, uh, September, when I declared my ambitions, it was with the understanding that we were going to have democratic elections. So it was the Somalis themselves, Somali citizens, who were going to vote. It was in 2016 when that uh, was now changed to us going back to having a president chosen or selected by the uh, lawmakers, uh, the parliamentarians and the senators. The parliamentarians and the senators, they, they are chosen through their clans. So we went back. We were no longer talking of democratic elections. So we went back to that system of clan elders choosing lawmakers and then the lawmakers selecting 
the president. And that's a process uh, that I felt was really highly rigged, it was corrupt, it was really um, already uh, I was being asked to provide uh, money in order to be able to get signatories to even proceed to, to putting down an officially. I decided at that point of time that I stood no chance of running in a system like that because it was really corrupt. It was about paying money. But uh, more so because it was again coming from a, a place of a clanism. It wasn't really built on the wishes of Somalis. So that is why I said it was a huge disappointment that the, the Somali citizens were now being forced once again to give up uh, and to, to align themselves with this clan-based governance system. That's why I said I stood chance. However, if I wanted to be corrupt, if I wanted to push through, I think I could have, I could have done that. But then again, my conscience wouldn't let me. So even going forward, it's, it's very apparent that so long as people are able to get into, the, into office, through the 4.5 clan based system, they will never remove that uh, 4.5 clan based system. So maybe there comes a time when you have to get into that system using that clan based system and then dismantle it uh, immediately thereafter and make the country ready for democratic elections. So these discussions are already uh, ongoing in Somalia because every four years that right is robbed the Somalis. So that's why I, I, I said that in that interview. Thank you. Uh, this question is uh, from Omar Shmuri, uh, another uh, undergraduate student at AUB. What do you think is the greatest driving role for your sense of morality? I, I think that uh, would probably be my mother. And maybe it is also uh, innately in me as well. I, I think I was born with that. With that. I am uh, very, my life is really, uh, I would say, black and white. It is either uh, right or wrong. It is ethically or morally correct or not. So there is no gray uh, area where you can move uh, and do things, you know, uh, while, while knowing that something is wrong. So I grew up with this and uh, from a young age, it was instilled in me that uh, this is the right thing, this is the wrong thing. And, and so to the extent whereby even when something would go wrong or uh, there would be problems in the neighborhood and so forth, the uh, elders and the neighbors would call me to say, Okay, since you are the one that will probably say what has happened, can you tell us what happened? So even though a lot of the, my friends and many others would say, don't say that, don't tell them anything, I was always the one that would admit if there was a mistake made or uh, something uh, unethical had happened or so forth, I would always be the one that steps forward to, to do that. And I think that also comes from a place of uh, spirituality that since my purpose here is to do good and it's to serve humanity i am aware that i'm here only for a temporary period of time so i always think about the hereafter and also really the footprints that we live on, on, on this earth. So this is something that is wired inside of me. This is what has made, I think, life at times difficult because uh, I have had to <laughs> leave uh, workplaces. I've had to leave uh, relationships. I've had to leave other things because of really this strong belief, uh, not wanting to back down that has made me also really uh, 
who's uh, very dear and close but also um, opportunities because I know that this is right, this has to be done. So I would say as I grow older, it just becomes uh, stronger that in a world that is constantly changing where materialism really uh, is, is a thing that everybody aspires to, everybody's thinking about what do I eat tomorrow? You know, what, what do I do tomorrow? And, and all of that. I think to myself that no one, no one of us would ever go hungry, really. I, if only we had very strong belief in ourselves. When we are presented with wrong things and things that are ethically incorrect, if we are only able to believe in ourselves to say, this is wrong. And I know by saying this is wrong, I'm going to not lose this contract. I'm going to lose this relationship. I'm, but with the belief that when you lose it, something else, something better is going to replace that. We call it Iman, Qadr, you know, believing that what is for you is for you. Uh, it can't be taken away from you and it can't be given to you. So for me, Something that is uh, strongly embedded in me. Uh, so I instill that in my own children. So, um, and I think now that we are talking, it's like we are we're being honest about these things. I think also, really, it is for the for the best. It is for the for the better that something like that is wired in me. Because when I look back at my life, look at how many times I have had enemies and I've had people really uh, stab me in the back. People, you know, uh, trying to shove me under the bus. People who've done all kinds of terrible, horrible things to me. It was that understanding, you know, that really made me uh, realize that it's because of my strong principles and values that these things are happening to me. So as long as I am on my side, don't compromise on these things, then I am OK. So that belief is, I think, also now really deeply ingrained, internalized. But it came from my mother and the upbringing that she gave me. Thank you. This question is from Diane Saab, a biology student at AUB. Thank you for your inspiring talk. What fields do you think are necessary to improve in your country and in the world to promote the leadership of nonconformists against corruption and injustice? And do you think Lebanese nonconformists can still stand with, resi with resilience to save Lebanon? I didn't get the first part. Um... What, what was the question of the, the past part? What, what fields do you think are necessary to improve in your country and in the world to promote the leadership of nonconformists against corruption and injustice? And do you think Lebanese nonconformists can still stand with resilience to save Lebanon? Somalia. Um is a country that came out of a civil war. Uh, that is something almost a 30-year-old civil war. It has had a um, succession of different governments you know, that are, have been transitional. Although the constitution, our constitution, is still provisional, it's still a uh, really hasn't been fully uh, ratified and agreed upon. So although we are calling the the outgoing government, it's been called um, Mali federal uh, government, it is still really a transitionary government or was a transitionary government because cannot have a government if the constitution is still provincial. So the constitution has to be 
enforced, agreed upon, and ratified in order for a government to call itself rightly government. This is how I, I see that. So, uh, what fields, what areas do I think need strengthening? Well, having uh, told you that we have just are just emerging from a very prolonged uh, civil war, almost all uh, spheres of Somalia needs development. There is no area that I can say is fully developed and it doesn't require work. So uh, every time a government comes into the office, because it comes into the office through a clan based system, there is no governance uh, system per se. So when the administration leaves, let's say, for example, there's a minister, the minister comes in, he hires his clan's people. So when he leaves, the clan people also live with him. So there is no governance uh, structure, uh, no civil servant sort of like structure that stays behind. So every four years, uh, new people come in and then they leave, after, you know. And, and so this, this is a system that we completely need to change. That yes, the government can leave, but civil servants and that structure must stay behind which then makes it a functional government because now it's just the individuals who leave but the system still functions it's of it operates so that's an area that we really need to focus on then in addition to that there are internally displaced refugees inside the country say more than even two million probably if there was a proper census done probably three million internally displaced so uh, we and also externally displaced you know we have refugees in uh, the neighboring countries so uh, putting a system in place for the safe return of these refugees is very important and that means also really uh, building even um, affordable housing think that the government can do that in collaboration with the diaspora so that when they come back they can live in this affordable housing somalis are geniuses they are able to make a living for themselves but they need a soft landing to be able to do that security is another uh, sector we are <laughs> we have a, a peacekeeping mission that has been there for donkey years south sudan recently had its peacekeeping mission leave but AMISOM in Somalia seems to have entrenched itself. So the security sector is a very important sector. We need to build our army, which is now sort of like gradually becoming a, a bit more uh, stabilized on their feet. We need to build our army so that we are able to defend ourselves. We cannot rely on foreigners to provide that security for us. And again, you know, uh, similar things. So, that's that's uh, you know let me just summarize by saying that we are going to have to really start from scratch build on some of the elements that you know some of the foundations that some of this transitional and uh, other governments have built in terms of non-conformists and how the role that uh, how they can play their their role in the banana I, I think a non-conformist is anyone who believes things can be done differently, who does not conform to the status quo, you know, who doesn't just run along with the herd of sheep because everybody's running uh, in one direction. A non-conformist is someone who always listens to, to their heart and to their strong principles and values, who knows what needs to be learned and still goes out of their way to do it despite all the hardships that will come their way and so they are there i think in lebanon in everywhere else they are there so getting the critical mass is very important non-conformists they tend to be just isolated in their little spaces we need to get like-minded conformists to come together 
really become the uh, catalyst, the critical mass that pushes the society that they live in to do the right things and to get things right without having to uh, fully uh, give up on their values and principles and without having to conform to an, an ethical society or, or governance system. Because I believe if a society knows something is wrong and they just sit there and they let it, they let it happen, that is an ethical society because they can change that. If they don't do that, then you don't have to be part of that society. You just have to really do uh, is right and go against the majority. So I hope that answered your, your question. Thank you. Can we take more questions for like 10 minutes, 10 more minutes? Is that okay, Fadumo? Thank you. So this question is from Sarah Siblani. Siblini, sorry. Uh, she is a mechanical engineer and MBA candidate. What would you advise the aspiring youth to do in order to enforce change in Lebanon? You kind of answered part of it, but if you want to elaborate. I think education is really important because an enlightened mind is one that uh, cannot be held in darkness. Without education, you are virtually uh, at the mercy of, uh, of people who are scared to live in, in light or who are scared to even let the light in <clears throat> because sometimes uh, ignorance is bliss. So people want to just sort of like close over, you know, they might just like closing their eyes and ears and, you know, they want everyone else to be in that dark place with them. So the only way out of that dark space is really education, because when you are educated, now, now you have wings. You know, just reading a book will even transform you, it will transport you from where you are to be able to even go to countries that you've never imagined that you would be able to go to. You know, the mind is a beautiful thing. When it is reading, when it is heavily engrossed in what it's, de it's doing, it's almost like it is physically in the, in the places that it is reading about. And so the, the mind now becomes the vehicle that propels you towards a changing the situation of your country. Because with education comes economic uh, emancipation. When you have economic em emancipation, and it means you're the one that decides how you live, because now you're able to put food on the table for yourself, you're able to pay your bills, you're able to, to stand uh, firmly on your two, two feet, so that when you believe something and you have strong beliefs about certain things, you don't have to worry that if I express myself, will my family throw me out? Will my society ostracize me or all of that? Because you are economically independent and economically independent people are not going to be squashed and stood or, you know, beaten into a pulp or submission because they can just fly anytime, you know, and just go somewhere else and live the life they want. So education is very important. It's also important that you are economically independent. When these two come together, then you are a very powerful force. Now, if you add uh, an ethical way of living to that, now are uh, so fearsome that even the countries where you are in, they would be quivering in their boots. Because you have education, you are economically uh, independent, but on top of that, you are a morally conscious person. And you will not shy away from exercising that moral right. Then with those three things combined, and you get uh, other youth to come along with you, then you have already changed the fabric of that society. Because when there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, now you spread. And when you spread and you become bigger, 
then you are on your way making that difference in your, your respective countries. So those three things are important. For me, those are the three things actually that, that uh, gave me the wings with which I am flying. You might, might not have to be a financially rich or whatever, but as long as able to fly with those three things, then everything else is secondary. Everything else will fall into place. So I urge uh, the Lebanese youth um, to, to really uh, think of their country and think of their country as an asset that they need to really uh, protect. Because your country is an asset. At the end of the day, it is also an asset that you pass on to your children, and they pass it on to their other children. It's the only place that you belong you can go somewhere else. But ultimately, your country is home. It's the only place where you can come back and be who you are and where you can be at peace. So do everything that you need to do. Don't shy away from doing the right thing. But first, help yourself before you can help others. And you help yourself by getting that education, by becoming economically independent, and by becoming a, a patriot who believes in their country and uh, in the greater good of its people. Thank you. This question is from Dr. Kath Catherine Shank Iglesias. Hopefully I said uh, your name correct, uh, your last name correctly, Dr. Catherine. She is from the Faculty of Health and Sciences at AUB. You mentioned moving internationally from one country to another. Did you ever run into political or legal limitations when traveling or entering a new school workplace? No, uh, I, I have been very, um, I think, uh, fortunate. I think it's because both of my mother and father, they, <laughs> they blessed me. But I have never had uh, any, any problems. And wherever I have gone, I have always had, uh, I have had it easy. I had, uh, had people who have actually uh, come out and gone out of their way to make that um, transition and that period quite painless that have, have become a family to me during that time that I was in those spaces. And um, although I am a Somali through and through, I was born in Kenya, but in 1989, my family was forcefully uh, deported along with first, second, and third generation um, Kenyan Somalis. I remember as a as a young girl having to go to the Somali embassy in in Nairobi and then getting documents that said go home. I had this white, you know, piece of paper that uh, said go home. When we got on the Somali airlines and we hand, uh, landed in Mogadishu as refugees, it became as a young child it became very clear to me that. The only place where I belonged, where my real home is, is Somalia. Because of my ethnicity, that is where I would be at home, and that is where I would be welcomed, and that is where I can just go to sleep without having to fear, without having to fear persecution, deportation, or, you know, without having to really uh, feel uh, humiliated dignified and all of that. At that age, when it really hit me, uh, this is homies. Here are people like me, you know, and here I don't have to fear. From then onwards, I knew that no matter where I go, despite being a transnationalist who always travels and is in different spaces, and for that period of time, if I sat my home there, it is temporary. But home, the permanent home for me, where I would like to even have my final resting place be in, that is Somalia. Because whenever I am there, I always feel like at peace. So I have had 
the privilege of being in different countries, in different places, and having uh, families uh, who have actually taken me in and adopted me in those uh, countries. And wherever I go, there are still people that I consider as family because they welcomed me to their respective countries. So uh, temporary shelters or temporary countries where I have been, I've not had any political or any uh, per se. And you know, the home to me is Somalia. It'll always be Somalia. And even my children who have been born in other countries, you know, you speak to them, they will tell you that their home is in Somalia. I think this is something that is wired in all Somalis, wherever they are. You know, Somalia calls to us. This is where our heart beats. So it's, it's Somalia is sort of like a, 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 where our heart is. We, our bodies, minds might be uh, occupying other spaces. They might be living in other countries, but our heart beats collectively inside Somalia and that is why it is very precious to us that it continues to beat because when that heart stops then we will all die wherever we are. We will just be empty shells walking without without a heart and without a heart there is no point in living. It becomes useless. So, so I, you know, whatever I have been even here temporarily where I am in Abidjan. I've never had any any problems. It's it's been um, been easy, and I, I hope it continues to. Be. I hope and pray that Somalia becomes the safe heaven where we can all be and not have to be in this other temporary spaces. This is why when I went to Finland, I understood being a refugee. Uh, was not uh, a permanent status for me. It was temporary. I always knew I was going to go back to Somalia. It wasn't for me to to fight and try and carve a space for myself in those other countries. That they gave me a temporary shelter, but I have a home and I have to go back home, and home is Somalia. Thank you. This uh, question is from Dr. Brigitte Vex from the Lebanese American University. When undertaking such a courageous step as you have done, how important is a support network and how do you build this network? Thank you. A support network is very, very important. Um, and I actually came to understand the importance of having a support network when I embarked on that, uh, on that journey. Because as I said, and I don't want to go into detail, Lost, yeah, I had to give up on a lot of um, dear, dear, I think things and um, also relationships to be able to really uh, stay on that uh, rightful part I had chosen for myself. So um, once I understood how lonely and um, Rocky that uh, road is, then decided that I wanted to set up something that was called She Runs Africa. She Runs Africa is a, is a political campaign fund uh, that is meant to mentor and it is meant to provide that safety network for uh, African female political aspirants. It's a safe space where we can hold them during that time, but a uh, space where they can also really share what they're going, going through with similar like-minded women who have gone through that, that road. And it was, to me, I, I felt no other African woman should have to endure the things that I have endured. They do not have to give up certain things in their life to be able to do things that they're very passionate about. So it's important that <clears throat> that network is there, that support network, the safety net, once they fall and fall on that net and they know that 
have to break their bones. They can just get off the net and continue walking. It, it, I learned, learned it's the hard way that such a, a support is very, very important. Um, likewise, I think um, it's uh, important that that financial, you know, uh, support is there because when women are running for office, they need financial support. They don't have networks like men, you know, where they have these men's clubs and they have these small networks that are very influential where they decide who moves up their ladder, who goes where. Women don't have that. And so it's, it's imperative that in addition to that uh, personal, you know, moral, emotional support, that there's also financial uh, support for them to be able to to uh, uh, undertake their campaigns, but also really um, mentoring, coaching, uh, training, how to actually uh, undertake a political campaign, to prepare your campaign products, how to give a speech, how to draft a policy. This kind of things is very important. And so this She Runs Africa, which is uh, one element of the foundation that I've set up, you know, is the Paduma Dai Foundation. One, one component of that uh, focuses on, the, on that aspect, and it's called the She Runs Africa. So I think it is very, very important that that network, uh, safety network, is there for me. Two more questions, I promise. Uh, so here, Mary Ann Shaheen, a chemistry student, do you have any regrets or anything you would have done differently? Um, do I have any regrets and would I do things differently? No, I don't have any regrets. If I uh, do things, I do them the same way that I've done. I have no regrets. Think. When one uh, decides to do these things, really think uh, of all the, the pros and cons and before I embarked on that journey I really uh, considered all of all of those things for me um, because I'm an introvert I'm someone who um, quite secluded I tend to just be in my own little space I, I don't like to be in big spaces where there are a lot of people there's a lot of noise and that I, I I'm just someone who likes to be by themselves, who just likes to cook and spend time with their, with their children, but just mainly, you know, uh, just stays by herself and uh, very much uh, interested in <laughs> being around people. So I'm very much uh, someone who is a hermit. I think you likes to be uh, in seclusion because I, I just like either Dating, or I like praying, or I like reading, you know, watching children or listening to music. I, I just prefer to do things that give me, you know, the pleasure of reflecting on life and living life and, and just just being grateful for, for, for having that life. But also, Having that uh, seclusion, having that uh, time for introspection and reflection, it also gives gives one, I think, the the the, the strength able to to do these things. So, if I were to relieve this experience, would I do things differently? No, I would want to relieve it the way that I'm giving it because all those experiences, everything that I have encountered, they have actually contributed to who I am. So if I didn't have those experiences, don't think I would be sitting here today talking to you. I would not be where I'm going to be tomorrow if I didn't have those experiences. So no, both uh, questions. Last question, though there are many more questions, but we took uh, uh, a lot of your time. Thank you again. 
Uh, this question is from uh, Zain Al Khalil. Are you in contact with Ilhan Omar? Ilhan uh, and I, we are uh, uh, following each other on Twitter. We are connected. So we were talking even before Ilhan uh, was elected into office uh, in Minneapolis and then uh, in. So, yes, uh, we are in touch. Okay, uh, I, uh, uh, on behalf of all attendees, I uh, want to thank you for this inspiring mentoring talk. Um, very appreciative of your time. I know how busy you are. Um, while you were talking, there were three students uh, live tweeting. One uh, from my uh, from my team, Zena Al Khalil. And two students are actually taking a course uh, named Social Media Strategies, Karen Rawi and Jessica Ashkar. Uh, the three of them have been uh, uh, tweeting live and they have been tagging you. So um, you're going to see that your uh, Twitter uh, uh, is on fire in the last hour or so. I want to also show you that your picture is now hanging in my office. The picture above. Uh, your picture is that of Nobel laureate Sir Fraser Stoddart, who gave a mentoring talk. The one uh, uh, next to you that is uh, um, by a stand up uh, a comedian, Maz Jubrani. And the one who is gonna, it's not there, but it's gonna be by another inspiring woman. Um, I didn't disclose uh, the person yet, but it's gonna be on April 20. Uh, and uh, once again, I thank you for your mentoring talk and I uh, look forward to meeting you in person. Hopefully next time you are in Beirut. Uh, thank you and you have a great night and thank you for everybody who attended uh, this uh, mentoring talk. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.